Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, your libertarian-flavored coping mechanism for the political week ahead. I am Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Peter Suderman, and the Southern California Journalism Award-winning columnist, Catherine Mangu Ward. Please clap. Howdy. But Matt, I- Hello, Matt. My lifelong quest to defeat Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in the uh, LA Press Club Awards is, it's a- Sort of a bittersweet victory because he he wasn't in my category this year. Yeah, well, he well happy won. Monday to you. He abdicated <laughs> the field. She, Kareem is just a uh, superior competitor, Catherine, as we know. Um, and, so uh, he's uh, writing another Sherlock Holmes mystery. Those were good. Uh, but congrats yeah. to also the other uh, six reason winners in uh, in their various categories, including um, renowned sports writer Jason Russell, our managing mm -hmm. editor, who wrote about pickleball. It's a good piece. Wrote about pickleball. Uh, so does right. this mean you have to move to Southern California now? Uh, if I must, I must. Uh, the, we're, the, the tan era of uh, Catherine is really something that we can all look forward to. <laughs> um, <laughs> We're going to talk about other important stories of the week here in a moment. But first, a word from our sponsors over at Students for Liberty. The most important ideas are those debated on college campuses. Think about how many different fringe concepts initially spawned in the academy that are now prevalent across society. F.A. Hayek noticed this phenomenon. The ideas developed in academia soon spread to the rest of society. That's why Students for Liberty supports students like me in spreading the ideas of liberty on campuses. As a coordinator with SFL, I've hosted high-profile speakers to discuss the pressing issues of the day, published magazines and articles to spread pro-liberty ideas, and helped organize and attend conferences on campuses around the world. SFL connected me with partner organizations, and thanks to SFL, I've been accepted to internships at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, National Review, the Cato Institute, and will start as an assistant editor at Reason Magazine this summer. My name is Jack McCastro, and I'm one of the thousands of volunteers from the SFL network building a freer future for people across the globe. Visit SpreadLiberty.org to discover how you can contribute to building a freer future at school and beyond. Okay, a happy presidential debate week for all who celebrate, and a shout out to our fabulous geriatric candidates. I, for one, did not think that they were actually going to go through with meeting face to face in a debate debate setting. Um, uh, although I'm kind of uh, bummed that the other fabulous geriatric candidate, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., is not going to join them, let alone uh, ballot qualifying candidates Chase Oliver and Jill Stein. But uh, one real world backdrop uh, to this executive uh, branch reality, regardless of whether it comes up in the political theatrics of the week, uh, came last week from the Congressional Budget Office when it revised its uh, budget and debt forecasts for this very year of, of our Lord uh, 2024, adding a crazy $400 billion with a B to this year's deficit. That puts the one-year deficit at more than $1.9 trillion. Um, how much money is that? Uh, in nominal terms, that's larger than Bill Clinton's last budget overall. Uh, when you adjust the number for inflation, it is uh, higher. This year's deficit is higher than every year's federal expenditures from 1974 on backwards. Uh, I would remember 1974. On a uh, per capita uh, basis adjusted for inflation, the federal government right now is spending around $20,000 per person. In 1965, that was around four thousand. So congratulations, everyone. Uh, interest payments on the debt like this year right now is at $892 billion, which means that we have finally arrived at the moment when we're spending more on a do nothing interest than we are on defense and military. And America, of course, famously spends more than the uh, 10 uh, uh, next uh, biggest spenders on military spending uh, in the rest of the world combined. Uh, don't worry, it's about to get a lot worse. According to the CBO, annual debt service one decade from now will increase to $1.7 trillion, quote, measured in relation to the size of the economy. Those outlays grow from 3.1% of GDP in 2024 to 4.1% in 2034, at which point they would nearly equal projected outlays for Medicare. Uh, so speaking of Medicare, Peter, uh, what happened? Uh, why uh, did the deficit suddenly get uh, jack? 
jackbooted up $400 billion from the CBO in uh, mid-season. Uh, so the $400 billion figure is heavily due to student loan forgiveness. But the the what really happened here is years and years of spending without raising enough revenue to cover that spending. So there was more spending and not enough tax revenue to to actually like to pay for it. And that is how you get a deficit and debt that looks like the numbers that you just gave us. And the plan is more of that because that's that's what our candidates have uh, in in store for us. The, the Biden campaign is promising three trillion dollars in deficit reduction if you follow their 2025 budget. But there's a couple of problems with that. One is there is no way on God's green earth that we're actually going to pass the Biden administration's 2025 budget. It's, it's just a total fantasy budget, raises taxes on the rich in ways that is just not going to get past Republicans if they have any kind of control of the House or the Senate, which is quite likely coming up. So it's it's just completely implausible. But even if even if we passed the Joe Biden budget and it went exactly as the White House has planned, which Okay, implausible, but let, let let's just roll with it. You still get a situation where debt continually uh, continues to rise um, and is at historically unprecedented levels. It's just a little lower than the historically unprecedented levels that you would have otherwise. Now you might be thinking, well, you know, I'm sure Trump has a plan for this. No. No, Trump does not have a plan for this. And if you talk to people in the in Trump's orbit, um, if you uh, look at what his uh, sort of econ advisors and the people who he is close to, like Stephen Moore, are telling The Washington Post, are telling other Republicans, it's great. Stephen Moore, who is a longtime Republican uh, economic advisor, uh, who has always been, he's, he's always been somebody who's actually kind of soft on the deficit, and he'll even say this. He told the Washington Post, you know, I'm not a big deficit hawk in the way that some Republicans are, but he's, he says, well, it's, it's pretty concerning right now. And he has a plan. And his plan is, what if we replaced the expected 1.6% growth figure with a 3.1% growth figure? Then it's all solved. And that's it. That's his whole plan is just just scratch out the, the low growth numbers and bring back high growth and that'll fix it all. And it's true that would fix it all. But there's not a plan to get to that high level growth. So uh, the uh, you know, the headline from actually from The Washington Post this morning was something to the effect of debt and deficits are unprecedented, uh, are, are high in an unprecedented way. And neither president has a plan to fix them. That's just about right. Nick, uh, speaking of the growth, you know, you've been promising <laughs> all of us for a long time. Yeah. Um, that this level of deficits and uh, and debt payments are going to uh, be a damper, dampener, damper. Uh, yeah. Who knows on economic growth? Um, is that happening? Considering that America is still the economic engine of the uh, of the world, uh, it's not what it could be, uh, and it also throws in a lot of volatility and things like that. So I don't I don't think anybody. Uh, in the economics game, other than Steve Moore, who uh, you know was one of the founders for Club for Growth and worked at Cato for a long time, uh, before he became such a bad speaker that at various points the Washington Post said they would no longer use him as an economic expert uh, because his stuff just wasn't you know viable anymore. Uh, other than him, everybody admits that having massive, persistent, and growing uh, national debt hampers long-term economic growth. So that's what, you know, one of the things that we need to be uh, focused on in all of this. And, you know, instead of having 2% or 3% or 4% annual growth over the long haul, you end up having something, you know, like half a percent or 1% or whatever. The 21st century has seen less than average growth. So I don't think that's uh, in question and people understand why. You freeze out things, you uh, make things uncertain. Um, and so investment doesn't happen when you have massive and growing and persistent national debt. Uh, the other thing, and this here, I'll make the libertarian case for raising taxes, uh, which is that what happened at a certain point in time, both Republicans and Democrats realized like, well, you can give people more government, you just don't have to pay for it. And that creates uh, what I once termed uh, government by Groupon. Uh, you know, we were getting, you know, we're getting uh, for 70 cents, we're getting a dollar's worth of government goods. We'd be foolish not to keep buying and getting more and more. Um, there were Didn't a couple Groupon of- Didn't Groupon go out of business? Yeah. 
you know, and yeah. it happens, right? It happens, but they're not the world's reserve currency, you know, or, or even in <laughs> discount coupons, that's like camel bucks <laughs> are still the Bitcoin of, uh, of that kind of fiat. Um, William Niskanen and a couple other people, uh, uh, Peter Van Doren at Cato years ago, showed that when there are tax increases to cover increases in government spending, the demand for government goes down. Because you might be willing to put up with a bunch of bullshit that you're getting something out of if it's only 50 or 60 cents on the dollar. But then when you're actually charged full price, you're going to be more thoughtful and say, you know what, I don't need this massive expansion of the state into this, this, and this. Um, so, you know, I think that's weirdly something libertarians should be getting in front of now are tax increases to say, if this government is worth having, let's fully fund it now. And I think you'll see a lot of people say, fuck this, let's come back to smaller government that delivers a few basic things well. And that's going to be an issue coming up because the Trump tax cuts all expire in 2025. So all of the individual tax cuts that were passed as part of the TCJA back when Trump was president, they're all, they were all temporary. They were set to expire in 2025. And so that is coming up for renewal with whoever is president next year. And Trump's position is basically we're going to extend all of the tax cuts. And Biden's position is we're going to st extend all of the tax cuts for people making under $400,000 a year. But either way, if you just look at the the, the revenue effects there, uh, uh, that's going to that's gonna add to the deficit because, uh, again, you can add to the deficit by spending more, but you can also add to the deficit by bringing in less revenue because the deficit is just a measure of the gap between the two. Catherine, are there any libertarian alternatives to Nick Gillespie's plan to tax us to death? I mean... A crazy idea is that we could just spend less money and reform uh, the major cost centers, which are entitlements. Um, that is actually a crazy idea at this point. Like there is no major candidate who is even remotely considering thinking about thinking about doing such a thing. Um, I, I find myself increasingly identifying with um, the head of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, Maya McGinnis, who is being quoted in every newspaper in America, just increasingly like despairingly frustrated um, her quote in The Washington Post this morning is, this is a campaign that is just unserious when it comes to fiscal policy. And that's true. There is no one who is being serious about it. Um, the uh, the folks at, do we say Kerfba? Is that what we say? No. C-R-F-B. Um, they uh, have been fighting this fight for a long time. Uh, they have attempted to be the voice of reason in uh, in this conversation. And so I, I'm enjoying like her her slow just like breakdown in the public eye. Um, but yes, the libertarian solution is government should do less. And um, that is there are you know, there is no streak of libertarianism in uh, certainly a Donald Trump's approach to um to the federal budget from that perspective. And uh, Joe Biden, I would say, somehow even less than zero. 12 years ago, when you had rates drop, you uh, as part of the Great Recession, you had this argument going around that it would be irresponsible not to borrow, that because uh, borrowing costs were so low at the time, you know, we should just go ahead and uh, run up the deficit as high as possible. And we did. And guess what? Now it's a problem. And this is this is one of the things that drives me crazy is you have some folks who are saying, well, now is the time for deficit reduction because we do actually have more fiscal constraints here in 2024. But go back and read those CBO reports, those long-term budget reports from 2010 through 2014. That's what or chat so. GPT is for, Peter. Indeed. <laughs> well, that's that's what chat GPT is for. But some of them, some of us read those reports at the time and what the Congressional Budget Office kept saying was, if you don't do something now, it becomes much harder to do something later. And we are now at the point where it's later and it is much more difficult to to even put together a solution numerically that that actually works to bring the deficit down to a sustainable level. Uh, Matt, I'd also like to throw onto the table as long as we're talking about how, you know, how do you cut spending or expenditures and things like that? Uh, looking at tax expenditures, which used to be a staple of budget reform policy, you know, go back 10, 15, 20 years, uh, things like the, um, uh, the um, mortgage interest deduction, health care deductions, various kinds of payroll deductions, child tax credits, uh, and earned income tax credits, things like that. 
that would be great to start talking about this kind of stuff again. The the real driver of this, I mean, we can say it's entitlements, which it certainly is, and rising interest payments, but it is a mentality among Americans that they are entitled to everything that they can get from the government and that we're all middle class, so we all deserve everything all the time in bigger and bigger numbers. It is insane. If you're making 400 grand a year, you should be getting nothing from the government. Your taxes should be lower and flatter, and you shouldn't be taxed 50 times on the same dollar and things like that. But but you shouldn't be qualifying for anything, you know, coming out of the government. You're not poor, and I don't care if you live in New York City like I do. You're rich and pay your way and pay your kids' way. Um, and then if you're middle class, you shouldn't be getting more and more stuff all the time. Work harder and pay for the stuff that's most important to you. We should have a government that exists, you know, to maintain order and to adjudicate claims and things like that and to enforce property rights. And then we should be able to help poor people who really need it. But like the entitlement mentality, which is just universal and ubiquitous now in America, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger, that ultimately is the driver of this. And we have to start looking at everything that the government is giving to everybody, you know, that it's a universal right. Uh, you know, that's got to go. It's just, it's unsustainable. And if millennials and Gen Z are going to bitch and moan about the shitty world that Gen X and the boomers left for them and their right to, it's like, you got to start looking at what you're going to cut because this stuff is just not affordable. What America has been running on in terms of fiscal policy is something like low tax socialism. It's this bizarre mix of, you know, uh, American vaguely right wing, low tax uh, a, a relatively low tax ethos with a high spending ethos that just doesn't work in the long term. Catherine, uh, at some point in the nearish future, there's going to be a moment when uh, significant members of the political class, however defined, are going to say, oh, wow, we really need to do something about this. Hmm. Does anyone have any ideas? Um, and when that happens, are you going to say, yes, I have some ideas? Or are you going to twiddle those horrifying fingers of yours and cackle and do a lot of like witch hexes? Why not both, <laughs> Matt? I will be doing both. Um, I think the thing at that moment, and that because I agree that that moment is coming, and I think that at that moment, the important thing is to not indulge the bullshit fake solutions that a lot of uh the candidates nowadays are running on, right? So this is, you know, the classic is, oh, well, we're going to cut foreign aid. That's not going to help. Um, we're going to eliminate waste, fraud, and abuse. Sure, great idea. Not going to help. Um, you know, Trump has said a lot of different things, a lot of different things uh, uh, about this over the years, including that, like, somehow oil and gas revenues are going to fill the gap or something. Um, there is the, we're just going to grow our way out of this solution, which again, good idea to do things to promote economic growth, but that is not going to be enough. I think that there is, you know, and of course on the democratic side, it's tax the rich, no problem, we're done, bye. No, nothing to see here. Um, the We are past that moment. We are well past that moment. And the cover story of this month's issue, which should be arriving in your inboxes and mailboxes very soon, uh, talks about these kind of lies that we've been telling ourselves about how we can solve this. It's the equivalent of, you know, I'm going to cancel my Netflix and my family's budget is going to balance when actually you need to move to a smaller apartment and get a better paying job. So um, in that moment, Again, the solution is that we have to take seriously reforming entitlements. Very, well, very you, seriously. You cancel Peacock too. You can't you know, cancel Peacock. You can way. cancel Tubi. You can cancel whatever Q. Qu Qu what's the Quibi? Quibi. The oh, Quibi. Quibi can if Quibi you're canceled still itself. paying for Quibi, yeah, you've got <laughs> yeah, you have real to cancel big those. problems. That is not going to balance our household budget, and this kind of stuff is not going to balance a federal budget. Um, we need to dramatically raise the retirement age for Social Security. We need to means test it. We need to reform how we think about healthcare spending entirely, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I will also be cackling and saying, I told you so, for sure. 
I, I would actually, I would caveat one thing caveat that Catherine said there is I think there are going to be some ideas that definitely won't fix it. There are going to be Netflix cutting level ideas. And in fact, we are already hearing this from people in the Trump orbit about bringing back impoundment, about um, basically making it possible for the president to decide not to spend money that uh, has been authorized uh, or appropriated by Congress. This was a debate back in the 1970s and Trump wants to bring it back. These would be relatively small cuts. They wouldn't make a meaningful impact on debt and deficits. On the other hand, some of those cuts, um, provided you can actually do all of this legally and you go through the proper channels, like some of those cuts would, in fact, be good cuts that we should just do. OK, but you just said, provided we can do all this legally and go through the proper channels. And I, for one, don't really <laughs> want to live in a world where Donald Trump is out here randomly impounding congressionally I, authorized spending. I, I agree that that is an unlikely scenario. At the same time, we should be looking for things that we can say that would be a, a pretty good idea to do if you could do it the right way. Okay. 12 ifs. Uh, just on the um, on the, the, the Peacock TV cancellations and whatnot, I went down uh, to my neighborhood, uh, trade in your old electronics uh, thing. Not trade them in, but just get rid of them, offload them to someone who's- Did you uh, time travel to the 1980s to do that? Did you go to Radio Shack? Uh, I went to, to the local synagogue who was uh, collecting okay. everyone's old uh, junky uh, <laughs> laptops and whatnot. And uh, and the mountain of fax machines uh, was breathtaking. <laughs> um, I had no idea that people still had those around. Uh, and this is just word of the wise. Um, the old folks still have fax lines. They don't know about them. Go in there, get them canceled, and then finally we will reach peak afuera, and we can balance the budget. All right, let's. Uh, Did talk you take about a photo of those and text it to Catherine with just I, the facts, ma'am? I hate you all. Want to die? <laughs> hey, I had nothing to do with any of that. Uh, thank you. Uh, another topic that is actually likely to come up uh, in Thursday's presidential debate is immigration. Um, pretty unusually, given the policy trend lines on this issue, both major party candidates last week made moves towards uh, loosening some restrictions, uh, whether it's uh, actual or rhetorical. First, uh, President Joseph Robinette Biden II last week signed an executive order offering amnesty and a pathway to citizenship for roughly half a million illegal immigrants who are spouses of U.S. citizens, have been here a decade and have no criminal record. Uh, more surprisingly, perhaps a uh, presumptive Republican nominee, Donald Trump suggested during a Tech Bro podcast interview that uh, immigrant graduates from American colleges, including junior colleges, Long Beach uh, City College, shout out, uh, be handed uh, green cards with their diplomas uh, in order to keep those people here to start their own businesses or to work for other uh, tech bros. Uh, Nick, do you have reason to believe that uh, Trump would follow up on this? And is it a good idea? Uh, one, it's a good idea. Uh, you know, anything we can do to keep people uh, from foreign countries who come here to be educated and then, you know, we we pour a lot of human capital into them or invest a lot into them and then say, now get the hell out. That's obviously stupid. Um, we should make it easier for people in general to immigrate at every level of skill and, you know, uh, achievement and things like that. But I think it's I think it's a good idea. I think Joe Biden's plan is a good idea, even as I still even when I turn off all of my electronics, Matt, and I'm in, a, in a sensory deprivation tank, I still hear the people on Twitter shouting into my ear and blowing horns saying, they're illegal. They they committed a crime by being here, so they have to leave, you know, et cetera. And you have people like J.D. Vance talking about large scale deportation, uh, where he apparently is talking about getting rid of millions of people, forcibly removing millions of people uh, from the country, which will be a great look for America around the world. I am excited that both of these candidates are actually doing things that are pro-immigration. Um, what we have had in, you know, for whatever it is now, 40 years, based, almost 40 years, where we have failed to reform immigration in any kind of comprehensive or major way. You got to go back to Ray, the late Reagan years for that. Um, we need immigrants. Immigrants come here, whether it's legal or not. Um, and what you're starting to see are two very old men, very stupid men, very out of touch men, finally waking up. And, uh, you know, and recognizing that we need to figure out a way to get more people here who can work or deserve to be here and we need to change our laws. So I think it's all good. Whether it happens is another thing. But, you know, let's take let's 
take a victory uh, lap before we start denouncing everything. I think, uh, in in fairness, the chances of that being the main thrust of the discussion on Thursday are pretty small because Trump's going to come out and talk about uh, lurid crimes committed sure. by migrants. No, and, and Biden whatnot. has already acknowledged that he failed to control the border, and you know, and the, it, you know, it's also true. Like I, I'm as open borders as a libertarian can be. I reject that term, um, but we we do not have a functioning. Uh, you know, system on the southern border. And that causes a lot of chaos. Uh, and it creates, it makes it that much harder to actually start dealing with the vast majority of immigration policy, which has to do with people who want to come here through all different ports of entry, who want to come here legally and in the full, you know, sun, uh, sunlight of the day and things like that. So we need to we need to start moving towards having serious policy discussions about immigration. And I, I think these two things, particularly on the part of Trump, given the, how hostile he is to all immigration, this is a good sign. And it's a sign that rea- you know political discourse is catching up to reality. Um, Catherine, uh, looking at the Biden thing, can you take seriously for a moment or address the moral hazard argument? Sure, they're nice spouses. They haven't committed crimes or whatever, but they came here illegally. And what part of uh, against the law do you not uh, understand? Yeah, I mean, I do. I do think there is moral hazard in the kind of strictest technical sense. I also think um, that uh, for better, or for worse, we have. Um, you know, we have a robust bureaucracy that vets um, various marriage based green card schemes for fraud. And um, and I basically reject the idea that coming here illegally is itself enough of a crime to avoid your potential um, ongoing legal presence here. I just think people cross the border for all kinds of reasons, many of which are morally and even at the time legally defensible. Right. We're changing the rules now uh, about how we treat uh, people who are seeking refuge and amnesty, but um, there are many people who came here, at least with good faith understanding, that they um, could pursue legal paths and then got screwed. Uh, I do want to say that uh, the real major upside of this Biden reform is that perhaps we can get uh, a reboot of the greatest romantic comedy ever produced, which is 2009's The Proposal, starring Sandra Bullock and Ryan Reynolds, doing an immigration scheme. So (laughs) I just want to say... Wow. To Hollywood. If you think you could do better, I'm not sure anyone can. This is oh, one they, that's they tried right to it revisit. in the was it the eighties with Green Card? Green Card. Uh, yeah. There, there, Gerard, this is not a Andy McDowell is, and Gerard Depardieu, who is now, I think, in Putin's cabin, right, Matt? Yeah, I think so. You're a big uh, Depardieu completist. But any <laughs> anyone who wants uh, a little rom com to watch with, with their lady on uh, uh Saturday night. Really cannot recommend the proposal enough. Um, the Immigration Naturalization Services are the villain of the piece, uh, which is uh, so it gives it a good libertarian twist. I have talked about this before. I will talk about it again. But the Biden rules um, maybe maybe create more love stories ready to happen. I feel like there's so many follow up questions that would unearth Catherine's psyche, but we're just going to oh, have to leave those Matt, aside. Is it the- a movie starring a grumpy lady editor who kind of hates <laughs> dogs, who uh, also hates the outdoors, who finds love with the help of Betty White? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Let's talk about it. <laughs> Let's absolutely not talk about it. Peter, uh, you live in Washington, D.C. Um Immigration politics have kind of uh, rocketed to the top of the charts among voter concerns here. And per Nick's um, uh, depiction earlier, the things that people, I think, uh, tend to be uh, most upset about are disorder, scenes of disorder from the from the border and then scenes from disorder in big cities and maybe small towns uh, along the border where you see uh, economic migrants uh, in here doing whatever and uh, putting stress on systems. Do you see or detect any sense of seriousness, either from the candidates or just kind of like official thumb-sucking Washington, that would address specifically the disorder rather than what can we do to show that we are thinking about the overall problem, even if we're not quite solving it? Oh, yeah. I mean, the deportation squ- uh, SWAT teams that are going to be running around during Trump's second term here, the extremely serious deportation SWAT teams, where it's it's just going to be the most serious thing that you can imagine, especially when those deportation SWAT teams have to check if you have a diploma 
before they like swat you, right? Because I guess that's the plan now is we're going to we're going to have the the paramilitary anti-immigrant force, but if you just show them your AA from a community college, you you you're good, right? Like you can go back and and work. It's it's totally unserious. It's there's nothing about this that makes any kind of sense. I, I mean, you you can see that, that voters uh, prioritize this. I think part of the reason that voters prioritize this is just a, a general sense of disorder. Uh, but it's even more than that. It's a sense that there is something that there is something uh, awry in America, especially in big cities, but just o- overall and generally, um, that there that things are on the wrong track. Uh, Eric Baim is in fact working on a piece that shows that in times of high inflation, you tend to see a kind of, uh, it's not, uh, let's call it a nationalist sentiment actually pop up um, in, in, in populations. And what basically they, they sort of feel like things are wrong. Everything costs too much. Like things aren't working. The system is just gummed up in some way. And then they end up looking for someone to blame. And that the, the blame often ends up going to immigrants. I think that's at least part of what we are seeing here. And the p- political class that we have has uh, definitely decided to make an issue out of it. They have also not decided to do anything remotely serious in that way. It very much resembles the deficit. You could pass laws. You could think through the problem systematically and holistically. You could, you know, spend as much as you bring in in taxes and make a case for the taxes that you want to raise to say, look, we need it for the spending. You could say we need a comprehensive immigration reform in Congress. Uh, the, the people who care about this issue have, in fact, been trying to do that for about 15 years now. It hasn't happened. It hasn't happened for a reason, in part because we saw actually an immigration bill uh, teed up in Congress that Donald Trump more or less tanked because he wanted immigration and he wanted frustration with immigration to continue to be an issue going into the election because he views that disorder and that sense of disorder as good for him politically. It's a bad situation. We have a terrible political class. It's uh, I I'm looking forward to the debate this week. How about you? I mean, both candidates, in fact, have very, very explicitly betrayed their principles on immigration for electoral purposes, right? I mean, Biden's action at the border is arguably at least just a political move, just as Trump's tanking of that immigration bill was a political move. Both of them have moved in the opposite direction of what people who elected them wanted them to do. um, And it is in the service of getting the votes. There is a way in which Trump's tanking that bill is is worse, though, because that bill, while far from fixing all of the problems, was at least a step towards trying to fix the problems. And if Biden hadn't, you know, changed his policy at the border, it would have just been, well, we're going to keep the status quo, which is which is not what you want. But you know, I, Trump called for it, but it's the Republicans. I mean, why why yes, treat them absolutely- like children? Like they they're such babies and pussies that they're so afraid of this guy that they won't vote their conscience, so or maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe they were. I think they bear responsibility, no. of course, for their own votes, but they will say, I mean, you, there's or there's at least quite clear reporting that one of the reasons that they decided to, to tank this yeah. bill was because of Trump's influence. That's not me making that no, up. No, no, I'm not saying you're making that up. What I'm if, saying, if you, though- If you want to say that makes them babies, then that makes from them babies, a political and I'm saying pers- that's bad. From a political perspective, none of us can d- decide whether or not Donald Trump or Joe Biden is the next president. You have more opportunity to get rid of your local congressman or senator. Um, you know, and Matt, to your question is, are there things Biden could have been doing? He did start out the year uh, and part of last year with humanitarian parole so that um, there were attempts to process people in their home countries who were coming here seeking asylum. That's an effective policy, and it can be expanded to other forms of immigration control and flow and things like that. You know, the, uh, there is no question that, uh, you know, Donald Trump re- revived a- explicit anti-immigration sentiment as a major way of getting into office. Uh, you know, it was this, you know, what the second thing he said after he came down the escalator in 2015, I'm not going to be politically correct. And by the way, Mexicans are drug, you know, drug uh, smuggling rapists, right? Um, so that, you know, we, we need to deal with that, but it's also true that Obama was super anti-immigrant. Uh, he was, you know, he was worse than George Bush, who was not, you know, great, but was better than Obama. Joe Biden was part of that administration. Neither of the administrations deal with immigration. Neither of the parties do, and they need to. Um, and what I 
take out of this recent stuff that you you started this segment talking about is that there are concessions to reality, and particularly on the side of Trump. Trump knows he needs every vote that he can get this time around, and that's why he was placating, uh, you know, the the VC guys who were like, "Hey, what about you know semi educated foreigners? Can we get a special in for them?" I think that's a good sign. I think it's a sign both also that each of these candidates knows they are not going to win easily. And they've got to figure out to, you know, we're lurching towards a new consensus in America. And I think, you know, this is where libertarians can play a role, whether we're 2% of the vote or 12% or whatever, to push push that new consensus in a way that is more about free minds and free markets rather than the old claptrap that got us here. All right, we're going to get to our listener question of the week here in a moment. But first, a word from our sponsors at Lumen. Before we continue with the Reason Roundtable, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Lumen, the world's first handheld metabolic coach. It's a device that measures your metabolism through your breath. Then on the Lumen app, it lets you know if you're burning fat or carbs and gives you tailored guidance to improve your nutrition, workouts, sleep, and even stress management. All you have to do is breathe into your lumen first thing in the morning, and you'll know what's going on with your metabolism, whether you're burning mostly fats or carbs. Then lumen gives you a personalized nutrition plan for that day based on your measurements. You can also breathe into it before and after workouts and meals, so you know exactly what's going on in your body in real time. I've tried lumen, and I've got to tell you that it is a great tool for motivation and information. It's easy and it's fun to use. Your metabolism is your body's engine. It's how your body turns the food you eat into fuel that keeps you going. Because your metabolism is at the center of everything your body does, optimal metabolic health translates to a bunch of benefits, including easier weight management, improved energy levels, better fitness results, and better sleep. Lumen gives you recommendations to improve your metabolic health. And for women, It can also track your cycle as well as the onset of menopause, and then it adjusts your recommendations to keep your metabolism healthy through hormonal shifts so you can keep up your energy and stave off cravings. If you want to take the next step in improving your health, go to lumen.me and use Roundtable to get $100 off your Lumen. That's L-U-M-E-N dot M-E and use Roundtable at checkout for $100 off. Thanks, Lumen, for sponsoring this episode of The Reason Roundtable, to which we now return. Okay, reminder to email your short uh, queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one comes from Andrew from Ohio, apparently related to Ed, uh, who writes, Greetings, Roundtable. I just read Magic Pill by Johan Hari. Johan, Johan, whatever. In it, he talks about all that our food environment is doing to cause the rise in obesity rates and recommends punishing taxes on unhealthy food and bans on advertising junk food to children. I'm skeptical of these solutions, but individual diet and exercise isn't a society level solution either. What are some libertarian solutions to rising obesity rates in a world where the food industry is pushing addictive junk food our bodies are not designed to be able to resist eating. Catherine, you love society-level solutions. What's yours? I was just going to say, I think uh, this question, the the bit that I would take issue with is uh, obesity is not a society-level problem. It's an individual problem. And uh, we do have a bunch of society level institutions and structures that um, tend to socialize the risks of obesity. But those are the things we need to look at. So um, to the extent that the problem with obesity uh, at a societal level is that it raises health care costs for all of us. Hey, maybe we shouldn't be bearing so much of each other's health care costs. It's just an idea Uh, to the extent that – we are looking at uh, kind of the behavior of, um, you know, uh, snack food manufacturers in response to um, which ingredients are cheap. Uh, that's certainly something we could solve. We could stop subsidizing um, corn in particular, which is used to produce high fructose corn syrup, which some people are mad about. Um, in general, this question gives me real 1990s nostalgia. Like, remember when like half the stuff at Reason.com was – about like 
soda taxes and, uh, you know, menu labeling and like Jacob Sullum basically spent all of his time being like, I don't think hyper palatability is really a scientific concept with a lot of depth. Um, I feel like we did that at that time because it was the end of history and nothing mattered. And so it was fine. Um, a lot of stuff matters now that's uh, much more the business of the state. And so I would say, um, first of all, there are kind of big macro things going on here that are that are socializing the risks of obesity or the costs of obesity, and we could step away from those. But more importantly, even if we don't fix those problems, pro solving the problem of the fact that like Doritos are super, super delicious and a lot of people really want to eat like a bunch of them should be at the very, very bottom of the list of things for the government to solve. Yeah, I think you could definitely shorten this question to just are Doritos a market failure? And the answer is no. They are market success. They are they are amazing, and the costs of eating Doritos should be borne exclusively by the Doritos eater, and that is unfortunately not exactly where we are right now. But if we want to think about how to get there, it's not taxing Doritos. Nick, uh, can you, in your answer, uh, invoke both Pop Tarts and John Mackey? Uh, probably not. Yeah. Uh, but I'll I'll start with John Mackey, who I uh, the former. Uh, co-founder and or the co-founder and former CEO of Whole Foods, who I interviewed recently, he's got the right approach to this kind of stuff, which is he's created a, you know, a supermarket chain that promotes eating particular foods in particular ways and overall good health. And he's got a new startup called Love.Life uh, that is opening later this summer. Uh, that is an attempt to kind of mainstream that using persuasion and market forces rather than the uh, the grim hand of government. There are no bad calories, right? There's only bad boys who eat too many of those calories, which themselves are not bad, uh, period. Um, the one thing I would like to add to all of the discussion, uh, one is that obesity rates in America uh, seem to have plateaued. So not you know, not for the first time, might we come around to having some kind of massive society-wide plan to fix something right at the moment that it's no longer really that big a deal. Um, so there's that. And then the other thing I wanted to add to, when listening to this question is, uh, you know, the question about Ozempic. I know a bunch of people have taken Ozempic and, um, you know, they report that it's really great. Um, and, you know, the worst side effect, you know, the two main side effects are nausea and diarrhea. And it's like, OK, like, doesn't everybody have those all the time anyway? At least if you're listening to this podcast. Yeah, you know, and uh, but but beyond that, another uh, friend of mine who's a, uh, a kind of medical writer and things like that points out that at least once a generation, there is a new diet drug that comes along that is going to solve all of the world's fat problems. You know, and it was amphetamines and diet pills in the 50s and 60s. It was Fen Fen in the 70s and 80s. It's Ozempic now. And that almost always what happens is that it shows up. It does really great. Everybody starts using it. And then all of the bad stuff starts happening around it. So it'll be interesting to see if Ozempic, the promise of Ozempic uh, pans out or not. But, um, you know, it seems to me it's better to have something like Ozempic or other forms of, uh, of weight control that are not government, uh, you know, mandated. Uh, let's start with that, if it's even a problem. My contributions to the question are obviously one, be the change you want to see. Uh, uh, two, uh, let your kids play outside, make them play outside, force them, whip them so they go outside and play. And then finally, uh, beware of content coming from Johan Hari. Um, he uh, has a well-known fabulism problem, making stuff up problem in his past, and it's not entirely clear um, that it hasn't been ongoing. Every single one of his books has been challenged pretty significantly by people um, who are generally specialists in the field that he's talking about or subjects of his reporting themselves. And uh, and I have plenty of reason to suspect that. Not that, you know, the insights can't be worth discussing, but just, you know, word of the wise. Yohan Hari is not to be trusted, according to me. Um, all right. There's been a lot of... Also, uh, his general characterizations of humanity are almost always projection. Like, yes. oh, everyone struggles with social media. Everyone struggles with uh, addiction. Everyone struggles with snacking. Like, not everyone does, actually. 
Everyone struggles yeah, I with- I definitely don't struggle with Doritos. Uh, the Doritos struggle with me. The the Doritos is market failure version of this question, I think, points to a, an, a, one answer that hasn't been covered here, which is uh, if we think of these things as a, as a vice that people can abuse, um, I think that's a useful framework for libertarians to think about this stuff. So with gambling or with alcohol, I think we would all agree that there are people out there who have uh, problems, who abuse who are, uh, alcohol, who gamble too much in a way that is harmful to them. And the solution there is not, uh, is not to ban these products, is not to heavily regulate them. It's to, uh, have, it, it's to treat these people and, and to have them get help, right? And to try to find ways to, to help out the, the relatively small group of people who have those issues. But then the other thing here is is just that Doritos exist in part as a as part of a, a, a calorie boom, a, a food production boom that has happened over the last 50 or 60 years. And we should celebrate the existence of Doritos and other foods that are just entertainment and fun uh, because they have come about it in a in, in a series of decades where we have not solved the hunger problem, but where we have made just massive, massive gains in terms of reducing world hunger. And part of that is we've made calories cheap, like a, a side effect or a, a, a result of that um, coinciding with that is that we have made a huge number of calories just incredibly cheap, especially for first world consumers. But you go back to the 1940s and 1950s, the early post-war era, and look at the discourse around hunger and look at the discourse around, oh, we're just not going to be able to feed the world. And that was when the the population was much smaller. This is one of the reasons why people were worried about overpopulation. And as the population has grown, hunger has shrunk as a problem because we have figured out through technology how to grow more food, how to make more food, and as also how to make Doritos. And that's great. And so Doritos are a symptom of our, uh, you know, a, a demonstration of our caloric abundance, and we should celebrate that. I don't know how this became a commercial for Doritos, which are nasty. Because uh, anyway, they're so, so good. Move on now. Um, uh, there's, there's Doritos. The, there's Doritos there's, flavored. By move on, now I mean from this, you stop it's talking just and I start talking. Uh, there's been a lot of COVID policy retroactive hubbub of late with Dr. Anthony Fauci making. Uh, the book rounds, uh, ongoing hearings on uh, Capitol Hill. Senator Rand uh, Paul writing in the pages of Reason about uh, things regarding the kind of cover up of the lab leak hypothesis. Uh, so I thought we'd quickly go around the table and ask a big. I, I don't think I can do that, Matt. Quickly, come on. And ask a big picture <laughs> what if, starting with Nick, as soon as Peter stops laughing. Uh, and it goes like this. If COVID leaked from the Wuhan lab, if there was some American, some Fauci related fingerprints on that research, and if the possibility of those things being true were heavily suppressed, not just by Red China, but from inside the American public health apparatus and amongst journalists and academics, if all of that, which kind of seems as likely as not, happened, then what? What is to be done? These things sound very serious. Nick, what is to be done? Yeah, they, you know, and, and the first thing I want to point out, Matt, is that, you know, the whole COVID pandemic uh, ruined the rollout of the bat flavored Doritos that Peter I was so excited about. I'm going to kill. But uh, no, there there is a reckoning that needs to come about where did where did COVID come from? You know, because that's like not a, a small question and it's an important one. And whether or not the U.S. government was funding gain of function research and in what ways, not as a super scary, uh, you know, germ warfare thing, but as a matter of course, um, the way that people are trying to paper over all of this or say, oh, OK, it's in the past. We need to move on is deeply troubling. And it's not simply the mechanics of COVID, although that's front and center. It's the whole public health establishment, uh, people like Greg Gonsalves of Yale during the COVID pandemic, it exemplified what was wrong with the public health world when he, you know, on one day would say, you know, a bunch of nut jobs uh, protesting lockdowns in Michigan on the state capitol steps there was a super spreader event. And these people should be put in jail. And then the next day, he's saying a 10,000 person march for trans, uh, you know, black lives mattering in Brooklyn, 
not a super spreader event because the goals of that march were ones he agreed with. Public health is in disarray, and we need to figure out how do we do a dominoes reboot of public health in general, okay? You know, of saying, look, we fucked up, we put out the Pinto and lied about it, and now we, we got to get back to, you know, earning uh, customer trust and confidence. This is very important. Can I give an actual solution? Fire everyone who is implicated. Like, seriously, there's we have a bunch of very specific names of people who were on those emails doing, um, you know, suppression of speech who were, you know, like any, anyone who's who could be described as job owning. We should fire them. Uh, and there should be uh, investigations into who exactly should be fired. But um, I think, you know, certainly folks who pushed forward the gain of function research when um, there were some pretty clear uh, orders, messages not to do that, um, those people should be fired. Um, but also the people who pressured social media companies, even if the social media companies were up for it, still the social media companies were not the ones that ultimately uh, – you know, did anything that should be illegal. It was the government agents. So fire, fire everyone that was responsible. So Catherine, Anthony Fauci is already retired. He fired himself. Yes. Uh, what great. would you suggest? Francis Collins too. I'm talking about junior people. I'm talking about yeah. anyone who was on those email chains. I'm talking about anyone who, you know, processed the funding for the gain of function research. Like there's, you know, junior people are responsible too. I don't disagree with that, but then that's going to become the next big part of the federal deficit is going through all the lawsuits involved in firing people. Well, they could um, try. I mean, I think what I think what Rand Paul is doing is extremely helpful, and to the extent that we can take it out of partisan, uh, you know, kind of a partisan framework, it'll be better still. I mean, we can also restructure parts of the federal government that were involved with this and lay people off. Like there's there are ways to fire people who are responsible for this that are legal and should not be subject to lawsuits. Uh, Peter, as someone who lives in Washington, D.C., um, I, I don't recall there being much of any uh, sort of demand or expressed demand out there among the people around government, but not necessarily inside of it for what we used to do when there was a calamity. Like, let's have a big commission. Let's get Richard Feynman to, to do something with Pepsi. I don't know if he did anything with Pepsi, but I'm just now like thinking about Doritos. Uh, but the 9-11 commission eventually happened over the objections of George W. Bush and Dick Cheney, but it did happen. Um, is there any kind of commission forming, even being trial ballooned out there? I don't think there's a formal commission in the style of 9-11 commission. I've heard a few people make reference to it, but it's not something that seems to be you know, circulating as a major idea. What we've got instead are these hearings and Rand Paul pressing for information. We've got FOIA requests and we've got you know, congressional investigations ongoing. Because, And that, I think, is the thing that is going to end up mattering the most. It may feel insufficient, uh, but, but learning what it was that actually happened, who was responsible, what went wrong, and uh, to what lessons we can draw from that. At the same time, I think there's a real problem here. This is such a specific and unique historical event. It's hard to figure out what you should do. I don't know if anybody here has, um, you know, or it's hard to figure out what lessons you should draw from this. I don't know if anybody here has seen the movie Burn After Reading, but it's a very funny Coen Brothers film set in Washington, D.C. about just a series of uh, hilarious chaotic clusterfucks in which everything seems to go wrong, but it's not because it's not because someone was evil. It's just because there were a bunch of people were incompetent or stupid or misinformed or in the dark. And it just happens, right? Like at, all down the chain, either someone is stupid or they're bad at doing their job, or they just don't know something that's really important. And you get to the end and there's this review by an intelligence official talking to his talking to his uh, in, you know to his deputy whatever um and the the official says you know well, what did we learn and the deputy says i don't know sir and the official's like well i don't know either i guess we learned not to do it again yes that's right but i'm fucked if i know what we did and this is this is kind of the problem with uh with covid is you learn not to do it again but what was it we did 
You know, what's repeatable here? I got, we should put as much information as possible into the public domain. We probably shouldn't fund gain of function research again by uh, over the objections of authorities skirting the, uh, you know, skirting oversight. But is that very specific thing going to happen again? No, it's going to be something a little bit different. The, you know, to Catherine's point, the jawboning of social media, which is the subject of a Supreme Court decision that may be out by the time, you know, this podcast airs. Um, you know, that's something that we can definitely change or, or address in a, in a more fulsome, uh, you know, in front on fashion. Yeah. And there's just so many uh, moments in which clearly the people in the public health apparatus uh, told what they thought were noble lies um, and uh, documenting those and the effects and, uh, and uh, talking about it in a serious way as you shape and model um, future responses to respiratory or other types of pandemics, um, I think is, is kind of critical. And especially considering that, you know, the, uh, the CDC, uh, put in its big recommendations back in 2006 or so about the next pandemic. It's like, first thing we have to do is make sure that we level with the American public, including about what we don't know. Um, and like, if we squander trust, that's going to be the big problem. Um, so we already know not to do that, but we did it. Um, and so getting to, uh, documenting those moments when that was done, who made the decisions and what led to those decisions, I think is a, uh, a critical function to begin the long and possibly impossible task of restoring trust in anything, um, specifically about COVID. Uh, this, I think it's a, a near catastrophic breaking of trust in American uh, institutions. And uh, that's a bad impact, as Nick Gillespie will uh, happily tell you. All right, let's get yes. to our end, end of uh, of podcast, what we've been consuming. And sorry to cut off Nick, so let's, why don't you have, go first, Nick, what have you been consuming in the cultural arena over the past week or whatever time period you care to discuss? I have been consuming so much stuff that I struggled to come with one and only one recommendation, which I did narrow it down to, uh, which is Bratz, the documentary by Andrew McCarthy about the Brat Pack and uh, Matt Welch. As a Gen Xer, even though most of the Brat Pack are actually boomers, I think you'll, it's a very Gen X movie. It is the big whale of, of a baby. Um, Andrew McCarthy, uh, his acting career fizzled out for a wide variety of reasons, and he feels a need to say it was really all about a particular New York Magazine piece that called uh, a bunch of young actors who were mostly uh, overlapping in movies like The Breakfast Club and saying almost fire, that this, uh, that this one article that dubbed a bunch of young um, Hollywood people, the Brat Pack, destroyed everybody's lives and careers, et cetera. Like most uh, prosecutions, it falls apart under any kind of uh, uh, examination. Uh, but so when you think of the people who were in the Brat Pack, uh, you know, and this is, it's not an exclusive list, Molly Ringwald, Rob Lowe, Judd Nelson, Emilio Estevez, Demi Moore, Ali Shidio, and Andrew McCarthy. You can throw in other adjacent people like James Spader, uh, who cropped up as a villain in a lot of John Hughes's movies and things like that. Um, some of them had great careers and some of them didn't. Um, and it's mostly, it was a sifting of who was talented and smart and ambitious in their careers. Um, so Bratz is a great movie to watch, especially if you remember watching these movies when they were coming out and if you were young and ambitious yourself in the 80s. Um, and it's fascinating to look at the inability of the documentarian to really come to terms with what he was going through and what was going on in his life rather than trying to project everything on to these kind of vague, shadowy forces. Um, you know, people like Demi Moore, somehow emerged from the wreckage of this horrible moment to become the highest paid actress in Hollywood. Um, and then kind of fucked it up with a series of catastrophic choices, uh, movie choices, as well as personal demons. Uh, Judd Nelson and Emilio Estevez, who were extremely highly regarded for reasons that were unclear, but became more clear over time as they did more and more movies. Uh, and they revealed themselves not to be as talented as maybe uh, people thought they were at the beginning. And I focus really on Rob Lowe, who uh, appears in this. He's he has the most incredible career arc of any of the people you know coming out of that early '80s moment. Uh, Tom Cruise is kind of a different beast because he wasn't quite part of this, and he did his own thing. But Rob Lowe 
went through a real time in the barrel, uh, which we won't rehearse here. He's written a couple of great books about it. Uh, and among other things, uh, you know, to bring it back to Ozempic, he is now, he looks better than he did when he was young and he was very good looking then. Uh, and he's a pitchman for Atkins bars. Um, so there are ways that you can take control of your life, uh, but it begins with kind of acknowledging your agency and your autonomy in it all. Having said all of that, I recommend Bratz. Uh, it's a nostalgia piece, but it's also, it gets at, at a dynamic in America where people really are not willing to take responsibility for the choices that they have made and the actions that they've taken. Did they include uh, Robert Downey Jr. as part of their uh, click. He's he's kind of in the adjacent mode as is like Anthony Michael Hall and things like that. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. You know is obviously another character who, like Rob Lowe, really you know ended up you know wandering through random houses and falling asleep in Santa Monica and, and the L.A. area, um, and kind of came back. You know, kind, kind of, of took control like of his life in a way. The yeah. most now, the most lucratively successful actor in the history of acting. Um, uh, Peter, speaking of acting, what did you uh, what did you consume? Since Nick took us back to the 1980s, I will take us back to the early 1990s. I saw In the Line of Fire, the Wolfgang Peterson, Clint Eastwood starring thriller with John Malkovich from 1993 about a Secret Service agent who was the, the guy who didn't take the bullet for JFK, played by Clint Eastwood, of course, and the assassin who is trying to kill the president who is running for re-election, fairly thinly veiled kind of Clinton-y figure. In fact, they used some footage from the 92 Clinton campaign rallies on this. This is just about the most deeply 1990s film you can imagine. So the the bad guy is this tortured CIA-trained assassin who feels betrayed by his government, kind of reflecting some of the paranoid anti-government stuff of the era. You have all of this stuff about how uh, Eastwood's character is sort of a crotchety old guy stuck in the past and he's kind of sexist but it, but you know in a business like way and actually pretty charming right uh, the back and forth with Rene Russo who he's making fun of for being a female field agent you know and she's just window dressing here she's right, th that's not a real thing it's just so that the president can look good with his feminist voters it's very funny um, and, and it's just a great uh, kind of throwback film um, in in so many ways uh it's living that you know the, it reminds us about how much of the 90s was living in the shadow of jfk uh the sort of the dawn of the paranoid anti-government era uh and the, then the other thing about this was that i saw this at the somerville theater uh in massachusetts i'm spending a little bit of time in the boston area this summer and they found a 70 millimeter print or i think actually uh, a kind of cobbled together three-part version of it because the introduction explained that there were only six 70 millimeter prints ever struck for this movie and this uh this represented um this was sort of taken reels taken from three of them and then put together and it just looked so beautiful and it reminded me of the way that movies used to look a little bit faded but none of this kind of digital crackle that sort of crunchiness and deep black that you get from uh from digital from digital projection just a, a beautiful beautiful print a, a great celebration of a wonderful crisp old thriller that is uh that you remember as being pretty good but is i think actually much better than than people give it credit for for, also has just one of the great uh, kicker lines of, of any film I can think of. Clint Eastwood gruffly sitting on the uh, the steps of the, the Lincoln Memorial looking out over the Washington Monument, and he just goes, I know things about pigeons. Such a great line. Uh, the That is one of my favorite little runs of Clint Eastwood movies, including uh, totally underrated and really one of my favorite uh, movies, uh, certainly of the 90s, maybe longer, A Perfect World. Yeah, so he Costner. directed that. So he directed good. Unforgiven. And this was this was one he starred in right after having done Unforgiven. And but you're forgetting his other uh, Valentine to Bill Clinton, Absolute Power, uh, a movie where the uh, the president of the United States and Washington in general is considered so sub, uh, you know, the morals are so disgusting and disturbing. Um, I liked... Uh, in the line of uh, uh, duty, I always call it. I, I, for whatever reason, I've always called it in the line of duty. But it strikes me as incoherent in its nostalgia for JFK because the Clint Eastwood character at certain points acknowledges like kind of gross moral and professional lapses on the part of JFK, but then it's still kind of lionizing. Um, 
I, 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 what, I was disappointed with makes the it movie. Such a, I yeah. think that's part of what makes it such a great time capsule is because that era had that nostalgia for JFK while also kind of reckoning with the fact that he had real deep personal yeah. flaws. I don't think it reckoned. I think it was using it. Uh, well, it's you know, trying they, to, right? It's yeah, trying to do both yeah. at the same time. And, and that is that is a reminder of what was in the air, you know, during the during the early 1990s, yeah. the, uh, you know, the just Clinton, in a couple of years before the Gingrich Revolution, right? Yeah, movies, movies about the Clinton, about the presidency in the Clinton years, and actually Reason ran a couple of articles about this, are fascinating because there was this attempt to sacralize the presidency as you knew that it was really awful. And that kind of, uh, <clears throat> you know, that, that kind of self-contradiction is really kind of fascinating. Um, Catherine, uh, what did you consume? I uh, watched last year's John Mulaney stand-up special, or rather I listened to it on a long drive to drop off my daughter at camp. Uh, it's called Baby J. Uh, we have reviewed it and maybe even talked about it here, but I am late to the game. It is extremely funny. So John Mulaney, for those who are not um, on the internet, I guess, uh, was a, a likable comedian who was very likable, who then um, went to rehab and got a divorce. And this is his post rehab special. Um, the bit I want to draw reason roundtable listeners attention to is um, in most of the cities where he performed this set, he opens by calling out an inappropriately young audience member. So uh, in this in this Boston uh, stand up, which is the one that was recorded, uh, the kid's name is Henry. And uh, he basically just opens by being like, so, Henry, you may be familiar with my past work. This show is going to be a little different. I think the kid was 11. Um, and it really <laughs> uh, it really brought to mind for me a lot of these debates around um you know, creating age restrictions on social media and keeping the children off of the internet where they might be exposed to the bad things. Um, Henry's parents knew what they were doing. They brought him to the post rehab John Mulaney show. And it totally should be up to Henry's parents. You know, John Mulaney did not say, oh, no, I can't do my set. There's an 11 year old here. He acknowledges that what he's doing is not for everyone and that if people want to opt in, they can opt in. Um, just in general, a very, very funny show uh, and, um, you know, not really appropriate for 11-year-olds. <laughs> Did you listen to it on your headphones or were you forcing your daughter to After to I dropped her off, I had ah, a, a ah. four-hour drive home. I will say the first half of the drive, I listened to the new uh, Hardcore History episode about Alexander the Great, but um, I needed something to wake me up a little bit for the last part of the drive. So I, I went with the John Mulaney. Uh, my what, what You is a uh, is a half of a two-part uh, Netflix documentary called Bill Russell Legend uh, about not the Dodgers shortstop of the 70s, but uh, the Celtics center of the uh, uh, 1960s and just a gargantuan uh, figure in, uh, in uh, NBA history and and also just kind of like uh, post-war athletic civil rights 60s 70s discourse. Bill Russell, uh, he's it was great uh, for me because he uh, retired about right about the time that I started paying attention, uh, waking up to the world around me. So I didn't really get to see him play at all. Nick probably saw a little bit of him. Um, but he's, he won uh, just a preposterous number of championships, uh, very uncomfortably, almost always against, uh, my Los Angeles Lakers. Uh, and so I kind of wanted to, to watch it as a way of, of, uh, embracing the former hated enemy. It's a, it's definitely a B or a B plus documentary about an A plus topic, um, fascinating competitive monster and kind of intellect. He brought athleticism to a game that was pretty not incredibly high flying up until that point, but he arrived along with Will Chamberlain, Elgin Baylor, and Jerry West, who are all really great athletes, um, and kind of and Oscar Robertson, and they kind of changed the way the game was played. Uh, it's great. It has wonderful footage of uh, things that you would not expect, including college playing days and elsewise, and gets into his his not uh, shy support for civil rights and fights against uh, the segregation era that he grew up in or grew up around and had to face as a 
professional athlete. Uh, very interesting. And, and some of the commentary from people like Steph Curry in particular from the Golden State Warriors uh, talking about uh, his kind of intellect is really great. Uh, really interesting. I only watched the first half because um, then Jerry West died. And I felt kind of bad about that because he comes in. You killed in. him. You killed I him. killed by, him uh, off. I'm sorry, Jerry. Um, he, his arrival, uh, Jerry West, LA Lakers legend, also executive and coach. Um, uh, he was just so famously burned up <laughs> about losing a thousand game sevens to Bill Russell Celtics that he shows up in the documentary oh. and he sits down and he's got to be like 83 years old at the time. And he's like, I'm Jerry West. <laughs> like <laughs> It's so not over it. And it's fabulous. And you, I just love that kind of like competitive insanity uh, in there. So yeah, I stopped watching. And then also the Celtics uncomfortably won this year's NBA championship, thus putting them one up historically over the Lakers. And of course, a uh, former reason or, you know, one time reason contributor Garrett Quinn immediately because he's a Celtics fan and a mass hole like texted me like, ha ha, <laughs> Jerry West must be mad. Like after it just, these are the worst people on the planet. So I will watch the second half. I need some time to, um, to process. Uh, but uh, it's, it's very good. Bill Russell legend, Netflix, check it out. Um, all right. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. Uh, this far. Uh, speaking of listening and watching, there's um, uh, we recorded a Reason Roundtable uh, bonus live podcast in Washington, D.C. a week or three ago. It's going to be available today, I hear, um, uh, for Reason Plus subscribers. What may you ask, what you may ask is a Reason Plus subscriber. It's uh, someone who subscribes to Reason Plus, uh, for which you get uh, you ad-free browsing at Reason.com. You get the digital subscription to Reason Magazine, early access to all articles, 56 years of digital archives, uh, PDF versions of all printed issues, uh, exclusive online content featuring Reason editors, uh, and commenting privileges at Reason.com. Uh, and uh, so all of those are great reasons to subscribe to Reason, uh, just to get this really fantastic episode of the Reason Roundtable at which we did some uh, some game show. Uh, activity. I'm not going to lie about that. And, uh, and you can only find out uh, by being a subscriber. Uh, all right. Uh, Nick Gillespie, are there any things that you would like to discuss either involving the recent interview with Nick Gillespie or upcoming events that you feature in? Uh, mostly now I want to talk about the University of San Francisco Don's Matt Welch, but Dons, I'll forego man. that. Yeah. And and uh, and instead uh, remind people at Freedom Fest, the annual gathering in Las Vegas is taking place from July 10th to 13th. Uh, Jacob Sullum, Robbie Suave, and I will be there along with other people from Reason. If you use the discount code REASON50, REASON50, uh, you'll get $50 off. Uh, Stephen Pinker will be there, Matt Ridley, Ice T, Justin Amash, Kennedy, Rob Schneider, Ace, Dig uh, Ace uh, Bigelow, Ace Bigelow, Dirk Deuce Bigelow. Gigolo. Boy, <laughs> Ace Gigolow, Deuce Bigelow. This is Nick's my having loop. a stroke. Yeah, this is I I I need to go back into the uh, subversion uh, tank. Obama think, for, needs uh, to grab you by the arm reboot. and walk you off stage. Yeah, and then also if you're in New York on uh, Thursday, open to debate is having a, uh, de a presidential debate viewing party at Maxwell Social uh, from eight to eleven. I am going to be one of the commentators. Uh, it should be pretty spicy. Um, the one thing I can guarantee, even with that past glitch, that I will have more command of my faculties than either Donald Trump or Joe Biden. Uh, but go to uh, Google Eventbrite, uh, open to debate, uh, uh, presidential uh, debate viewing party. More right. command of your faculty than any Ivy League president. All right. Uh, uh, thanks for listening. We'll catch you next week. And goodbye. <laughs>